Before I uh, start on my story, I usually like to start with a joke. And the reason why I do that is I believe that humor is a very good way not only of dealing with mental illness, but of dealing with life in general. So there's a couple that goes on vacation to Florida. Because of work schedules, it's decided that the husband will go down a day before the wife, and she will join him on the next day. So upon arriving at the hotel in Florida, uh, the husband decides to open up his laptop and send his wife an email. But when he sends it, he leaves one letter off the address. Meanwhile, there's a widow coming back from her husband's funeral in Houston. She opens up her email, expecting condolences from friends and relatives. She reads the first e email, faints, falls to the floor. Her son rushes in, reads the email, which says, from your departed husband. I've just arrived and been checked in. Looking forward to your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> I had my first symptom when I was about 12 years old. I got my appendix out, and for about a week after that, I constantly smelled bacon. Now, bacon isn't around you all the time. You know, it just, it's not as if there's somebody in the back frying it up. It just doesn't work that way, right? I have surmised that that was likely, although I, can, I can't be sure, I'm, I've surmised that that was likely a hallucination. I didn't get any more symptoms till high school. In high school, particularly during exams, I had a lot of trouble sleeping. And actually, that's something that I still have kind of an issue with. Anyway, um, I didn't get any more symptoms till university. In university, I started getting, uh, I started, well, first of all, I was, uh, I went to U of C. I majored in physics. I was okay for the first few years. But in my final year, I started well, even before the final year, I was having trouble uh, concentrating. I was, so I was having trouble sleeping. I failed the course. I started hearing a voice. Now, I should say this isn't like your conscience. This is like there's a completely different person in your head who you can have conversations with. So, they, um, you know, I got into the arguments with them and that sort of thing. I... I had a couple weeks off school because it was Christmas break. I had just failed the course, so I was having some doubts about whether I should be in school. And the voice was speaking about those things. At any rate, um, I got very wrapped up in listening to this voice, so I, um, I stopped showering. I wasn't eating regularly. My, my mother was, was calling my place. I had a little basement suite. And she was calling my place, and I wasn't returning her calls. She became concerned. She called the police because she didn't know what else to do. They came and saw me. Somehow they got this strange idea that I had guns in the house, and they were laughing at her when they talked to her again because I obviously wasn't a threat to anyone. I'm sure all of you are just shaking your boots to look at me. At any rate, um, I, um, my mother came back to my place a few days later and found I was smelling a little ripe. So she came back once more and, uh, with a friend, and they took me to the hospital against my will. Something that I had real trouble with for a while. But she told me that I had this electric heater uh, in my place because it was cold down there. And uh, she told me that I had thrown a blanket over it, and there were people that lived upstairs. So that kind of brought the issue home. I realized, okay, you know, maybe something needed to be done. So um, she, uh, she, uh, she took me to the hospital against my will. They took me. They kept me there for about six months in the Foothills Hospital. And then they transferred me out to, to a facility in Clairsome. 
that kind of specialized to this kind of thing. And I was there for another six months. So I was in the hospital for a year. Now, as you probably know, that's longer than somebody is usually in hospital for this kind of thing. But that was 1990, and I've never been back. So I happen to think that there's... And Faye tells me that the research backs this up, that longer hospital stays are worth the investment. Anyway, um, when they finally let me go from the facility in Clairsom, I should say that I was never legally bound to stay, there, to stay there. I wasn't certified. They just didn't tell me that. <laughs> they made it appear that I had to stay there, and, and uh, that was probably a good thing because it got me stabilized on the medication. When I was in hospital, I was spending a lot of time in bed, and there was this one nurse who came and sat me down. I guess I was laying down at the point, but he, uh, he sat down next to the bed, and he said, I'm concerned about you. You're spending a lot of time in bed. You're allowing this to take over, and you're not fighting the illness. And, and he, even though it didn't speak to me at the time, later on it spoke to me. And I thought, okay, there's, there's some struggles here, but I got to fight this. And I got to, at times, I got to take the, the right steps to get myself well. And sometimes those steps might not feel real comfortable. And then there was one other time that I wasn't going to a lot of the groups. This was in the Foothills Hospital. In the, and, and I wasn't going to a lot of the groups that were, that were there. One of the nurses sat me down and said, you don't seem to be interested in the things that are going on here. I didn't say anything at the time, but now I think I would say, duh, I, don't, I didn't think I had schizophrenia. What do you think? It shouldn't surprise you that I didn't, that I wasn't interested in the groups. Anyway, uh, she, uh, they, they did let me go. Now, I still didn't think I had schizophrenia. I wanted to get back to school and get back to the things I was doing. I figured that the source of the voices were, were these creatures that lived on my organs. And that might sound a little far out, and I hear you. It is kind of far out. But, you know, the chemicals in your brain aren't working right, and you can believe some weird things. Trust me. I've been there. <laughs> um, I, when I'd been in the Foothills Hospital for about six months, I was going to go through a doorway. The doorway went down to the stairwell. Standing next to the door doorway, there was a male nurse. I said to the nurse, I'm going down to the basement to go to hell. Now, the nurse wisely turned me around and said, uh, no, you're not. <laughs> because I didn't know what I was going to do when I got down there, but it probably wouldn't have been good. When they transferred me out to Clarison, by this time I was down to hearing one voice. They had tried me on several different medications, and when they did, different voices came and went. But by this time, I was down to one voice. But this is also the, the time when uh, the torture that the voices used to put me through kind of reached a peak. So to demonstrate something that he used to do, I, I, I used, when I was walking from A to B, he would do this. The reason I am talking to you like this is, well, I feel like it. Now you get an hour or so of that, and you're going pretty squirrely, trust me. They let me go. Now, I worked in a, uh, after, I, after I moved back to Calgary. Now understand that when I moved back to Calgary, I was still intent on going back to school. And, and I was still firmly convinced that I did not have schizophrenia. However, by this time, I had become a Christian. And so I was... I knew that being on social assistance, which I was on at the time, that you weren't allowed to go, th to, go to school, even part-time, without special permission. I didn't want to go through the red tape of getting the special permission. So I thought about going to school under the table. But think about it. I, I had just become a Christian, and I was going to go to school under the table. So I put off going to, going to school. By the time I was on H, which was about six months later, I had an opportunity to go on a missionary trip to Argentina. I had $700 in the bank. I thought I could spend it 
and take a physics course, or I could go to Argentina. Well, I went to Argentina, and I've, uh, I've never actually regretted that. I never did go back to university. Um, you said that when you left Clara's home that you still weren't uh, thinking that you had schizophrenia. I forgot to mention that. Thank you. About four years after I was diagnosed, the, um, the guy who was running the Bible study that I was in at the time told me that, I, that he thought I had schizophrenia. And that I had a lot of respect for this guy. So I went home and I thought about it. And I thought about the things that had happened in my life over the previous four years. And just my life in general. And thought about, you know, that would really explain some things. So um, I thought about it and I realized that it made sense. You know, it wasn't an easy thing to come to terms with. But the opinion of this guy combined with me just looking at taking a, a second look at my life and that is what led to it so that took that happened about four years after I was diagnosed so that would have been 1994 well, one thing that did is that encouraged me to stay on the medication another thing it did is it just helped me to understand that you know to, to understand why my life was as it was. One time when I was at church and I asked for prayer for healing, and the guy that prayed for me says, God has given you everything you need to do what he wants you to do. So I think um, things are well in hand, but my illness is part of the package. I did take a couple courses at Bible school a few years back, but I found that I had that same perfectionist mentality that I had when I was in school. This mentality that ran me, ran me into so much stress. So now I read a lot. I love to read. It keeps the stress down. But there's no test and I don't have to finish the book by any particular time. And that way rather than the, stre than the reading raising the stress, it lowers it. You mentioned that you watch closely how much activity you do every day. Is there anything else you do like every day just to help you cope? Or Yes, absolutely. Another, another good question. One thing I do is I get regular exercise. Another thing I do is I watch my diet closely. And I, um, when the voices get really bad or when I get a re in a really down mood, I will sing a hymn. When you're on medication, are the voices completely gone? When I'm on the medication, the voices are not completely gone. Uh, he hasn't spoken during this presentation, but he, spoke, he speaks to me several times a day. That is something that I have learned to deal with over the years. I also deal with hallucinatory cold, hallucinatory pain, and hallucinatory itch and itching on a regular basis. And those are just things that like, it can be in the room one minute, it's comfortable, the next minute it's cold, and then, and then ten minutes later it's comfortable again, and the, the environmental conditions in the room haven't changed. So I figure from that, well, maybe this is a hallucination. Recently this, this shoulder was treated for a soft tissue injury. So when I started getting pain in this shoulder, I explained the problem of, of hallucinatory pain to her and said, okay, is it possible that the same thing is happening with this shoulder? And she said, yes, the uh, conditions of your bad posture would potentially bring that about. So I started doing the same exercises on the left shoulder that I was doing on the right. So that way I was covering my bases. And that's what I try to do in a lot of ways. Uh, as far as the hallucinatory cold goes, well, I ascertain whether it's real. If it's real cold, then I put on a sweater. If not, then I just put up with it. To give you a little picture of how I do, how I've done since, since uh, I got stable, I did work for about 10 years in a bookstore, and I did okay with that. But a new owner took over the store about a year before I left and she started introducing a lot of changes in a short period of time. I found that I couldn't deal with all those changes. In fact, 
one of my fellow employees who wasn't mentally ill was um, she was having trouble with all the stress. So that kind of put things in perspective for me. At any rate, I decided that uh, it was time for me to leave the bookstore. And I think I did that because I was supposed to work for the Schizophrenia Society. So um, also, there was a couple years ago where I went through kind of a depression and I got very much into reading dark material. I was reading a book where, where the author uh, felt that what he was suffering was the result of something he had done wrong. And I identified with that. His, his friends were telling him that, but I didn't find that. But I found that I had all the internal emotions that he had, so I really identified with the book. So it was interesting that when I went through that. But now I, I do all right, but I watch how much activity I take on every day very carefully. The outreach program, basically what happens is two people who have schizophrenia uh, but are stable get together with one person who is usually sicker and we usually get together with them at the place of their choosing, at the time of their choosing. And we talk about prognosis, coping skills, give them some social contact because very often, as Faye said, they're isolated. And this gives them some social contact and these other things in a low stress way. Help to become not so isolated. It's been statistically shown that the outreach program keeps people out of hospital, it keeps people on their medication, and they generally do better.